I am most grateful for the privilege of introducing, on behalf of the officers and Board of Education of the Church Educational System, the new student and teacher manuals for missionary preparation. These materials will be used in institutes throughout the world and will be the instructional material for missionary preparation at our universities in Provo, Idaho, and Hawaii. The content of this course material has been carefully integrated with the missionary guide, Preach My Gospel, and its planning tools such as the Missionary Daily Planner. The intent is to prepare future missionaries with a sound understanding of the doctrine and principles upon which our current missionary program is centered. The missionary guide Priest My Gospel has been so enthusiastically received around the world that I am confident that these missionary preparation materials, which are built on that same foundation, will be extremely successful likewise as you teach them under the guidance of the Spirit. A young man or woman who receives this missionary preparation course in an institute or in a religion course will be very well positioned when called as a missionary to learn and use the Priest My Gospel Guide. These individuals will have a head start and be strengthened from the outset of their missionary service to be very successful. The course is designed as a hands-on, student-centered learning experience. It must not degenerate into a lecture course. It is essential for each of you who teach this material to recognize that difference. One of the major objectives of the missionary preparation material is to help future missionaries develop the attributes, the skills necessary to teach and testify to the restored gospel with power under the guidance of the Spirit. Thus, this course is designed to help students learn, organize, and share gospel doctrines and principles. It is centered in the concept of your providing regular opportunities for each student to practice teaching and testifying of these doctrines and principles to fellow students. Obviously, the more students practice explaining and teaching these truths, the more capable they will be as they share them, guided by the Spirit in the mission field. Please assure that each student has repeated opportunities to practice teaching the materials you share with them. These teaching opportunities will help each student engrave in her mind and heart doctrine and principles so that they will be lived in their personal life as they prepare for missionary service. The course encourages students to continue reading, pondering, and strengthening their testimony of the Book of Mormon. It also encourages them to learn and memorize scriptures that will be needed as they bear witness of the restored gospel as missionaries. May I share two words of caution? As you work to prepare new missionaries, please do not model that teaching upon your model, your own past missionary experience. That could be outdated. Rather, follow the approach which is exemplified in the foundation document, Preach My Gospel. Intentionally, there are certain areas of missionary preparation that are best left to home and family or to the missionary training centers and mission presence. These would include information about detailed missionary organizations, budgeting, housekeeping skills, cooking, and so forth. These matters are not addressed in our preparation missionary course. To repeat, its principal focus is for the future missionary to learn the doctrines and principles that are a foundation of our current missionary effort. And these are to be taught as missionaries have personal experiences with fellow students in practicing their presentation under your guidance and direction. As I think about how your students will be prepared for missionary service, as they are encouraged and inspired in your preparation classes, 
I thrill at what powerful instruments they will become when called as missionaries. May you be inspired and guided in your sacred responsibility to use these materials with the finest generation of missionaries in the history of the church. And may the Lord bless you in your personal life and in your homes as you accomplish that sacred purpose. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. We have received, as did they of old, the holy priesthood and the everlasting gospel. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob are our ancestors. We are of Israel. We have a right to receive the gospel, blessings of the priesthood, and eternal life. Nations of the earth will be blessed by our efforts and by the labors of our posterity. The literal seed of Abraham and those who are gathered into his family by adoption receive these promised blessings predicated upon acceptance of the Lord and obedience to his commandments. But I have heard so many remarkable testimonies about wonderful men and women that have been brought into the church that I would like to say, you never know whom you will save. <coughs> to illustrate my point, I would like to go back in thought to my native Holland, where six generations of my father's ancestors lived in the little village of Scheveningen at the seashore. They were fishermen or had other related vocations like fishing boat builders, sail makers, or fishing net repairmen. Many of them were also involved in the voluntary but hazardous task of life saving. They were stout-hearted, experienced men who always were ready to man the rowing lifeboats to go on a rescue mission. With, ever, with every westerly gale that blew, some fishing boats ran into difficulties, and many times the sailors had to cling to the rigging of their stricken ships in a desperate fight to escape inevitable drowning. And year after year, the sea claimed its victims. <coughs> On one occasion, during a severe storm, a ship was in distress, and the rowing boat went out to rescue the crew of the fishing boat. The waves were enormous, and each of the men at the oars had to give all his strength and energy to reach the unfortunate sailors in the grim darkness of the night and the heavy rainstorm. The trip to the wrecked ship was successful, but the rowing boat was too small to take the whole crew in one rescue operation. One man had to stay behind on board because there simply was no room for him and the risk that the rescue boat would capsize was too great. When the rescuers made it back to the beach, hundreds of people were waiting for them with torches to guide them in the dreary night. But the same crew could not make the second trip because they were exhausted from their fight with the storm winds, the waves, and the sweeping rains. So the local captain of the Coast Guard asked for volunteers to make a second trip. Among those who stepped forward without hesitation was a 19-year-old youth by the name of Hans. With his mother, he had come to the beach in his oilskin clothes to watch the rescue operation. When Hans stepped forward, his mother panicked and said, Hans, please don't go. Your father died at sea when you were four years old, 
and your older brother Pete has been reported missing at sea for more than three months now. You are the only son left to me. But Hans said, Mom, I feel I have to do it. It is my duty. And the mother wept and restlessly started pacing the beach when Hans boarded the rowing boat, took the oars, and disappeared into the night. After a struggle with the high-going seas that lasted for more than an hour, and to Hans's mother it seemed an eternity, the rowing boat came into sight again. And when the rescuers had approached the beach close enough so that the captain of the Coast Guard could reach them by shouting, he cupped his hands around his mouth and called vigorously against the storm, did you save him? And then the people lighting the sea with their torches saw Hans rise from his rowing bands and he shouted with all his might, Yes, and tell mother it's my brother Pete. You never know whom they will save. It may be the one that on life's billows is tempest-tossed, or it may even be the one that had been reported missing at life's sea. And when someone will be saved through their rescue mission, oh, how great will be their joy with him or her in the kingdom of our Father. In zone conferences, which are some of the greatest teaching moments we as general authorities have with these young elders and sisters, I have asked missionaries what it is they want investigators to do as a result of their discussions with them. Be baptized. Just a chorus, just an anthem. Just knocks the whole south wall of the building out. Yes, I say we do, we do want them to be baptized, but what has to precede that? Well, now they're leery. Aha, they think, this is a test. Read the Book of Mormon, someone shouts. Pray, an elder roars from the back of the room. Attend church, one of the sisters on the front row declares. Receive all the discussions. Well, you've pretty much covered the commitments in the first discussion, I say, but really now, what do you want your investigators to do yet? Be baptized. The chorus comes a second time. Elders, I plead, you have already told me about baptism. I am still asking. Well, now they are stumped. Live the word of wisdom. Someone says, pay tithing, another shouts, and so it goes. I have to say that almost never do the missionaries get around to identifying the two most fundamental things we want investigators to do prior to baptism and anything else. Have faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and repent of their sins. Yet, we believe that the first principles and ordinances of the gospel are, first, faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, second, repentance, then, third, baptism by immersion for the remission of sins, fourth, laying on of hands for the gift of the Holy Ghost. A convert's new life is to be built upon faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and in His redeeming sacrifice, conviction that He really is the Son of God, that He lives this very moment, that He really is the door of the sheepfold, 
that he alone holds the key to our salvation and exaltation. That belief is then to be followed by true repentance. Repentance which shows our desire to be clean and renewed and whole. Repentance that allows us to lay claim to the full blessings of the atonement. Then comes baptism for the remission of those sins. Yes, baptism is also for membership in the church. But that isn't what the prophet Joseph chose to stress in that article of faith. He stressed that baptism was for the remission of sins, focusing you and me, the missionary and the investigator, again on the atonement, on salvation, on the gift that Christ has given us all. This points that new convert toward the blessings of the good news. You know that on every computer board in any language, there's one key that says delete. Well, have a delete key. And you develop your delete key, and if you have one of these thoughts trying to push itself into your mind, delete it. Now, what will that delete key be? I don't know. That has to be yours. It might be if you wear glasses, just this. Just thought comes into your mind, and you delete or it might be any, any little gesture that's private to you so that when these thoughts, these temptations come, you can just delete it. You can learn to control your thoughts. And as you do that, and as you follow the rule of obedience, then you're going to be all right. And you'll be guided. you have repented from serious transgressions and mistakenly believe that you'll always be a second-class citizen in the kingdom of God, learn that is not true. The Savior said, Behold, he who has repented of his sins, the same is forgiven, and I, the Lord, remember them no more. By this you may know if a man repenteth of his sins. Behold, he will confess them and forsake them. The discouraging idea that a mistake, or even a series of them, makes it everlastingly too late does not come from the Lord. He has said that if we will repent, not only will he forgive us our transgressions, but he will forget them and remember them no more. Repentance is like soap. It can wash sin away. Ground in dirt may take the strong detergent of discipline to get the stains out, but out they will come. Since the Lord wants a people tried in all things, how specifically will we be tried? He tells us, I will try the faith and the patience of my people. Since faith in the timing of the Lord may be tried, let us learn to say not only, Thy will be done, but patiently also, Thy timing be done. As there is time which remains to be improved this morning, I will offer a few remarks to the congregation. It yields solid satisfaction to hear men testify of the truth of the gospel. I would rather hear men tell their experience and testify that Joseph was a prophet of the Lord and that the Book of Mormon the Bible, and other revelations of God are true. 
and that they know it by the gift and power of God. Then hear any other kind of preaching that ever saluted my ears. Sermonizing, dividing and subdividing subjects, building up a fine superstructure calculated to fascinate the mind, coupled with the choicest eloquence of all the world, will produce no good to them. What is it that convinces man? It is the influence of the Almighty, enlightening the mind, giving instruction to the understanding. Which priesthood was restored through his prophet, Joseph, and without which no organization, no matter how well-intentioned, can operate without the sanction of deity. Of this great truth, there is no question. The Book of Mormon and Bible testify as to its veracity. Of this, you can be assured. Brother Eliezer, will you share your testimony with these good people? Much has been said today about the Book of Mormon and about the man, Joseph Smith. I can't tell you what to think or what to believe, but I can tell you what I believe. That is, I know. By the power of the Holy Ghost, I know that the Book of Mormon is true and that Joseph Smith is a prophet of the Lord. When I saw a man without eloquence or talent for public speaking, the Holy Ghost proceeding from that individual illuminated my understanding and light glory and immortality were before me. I was encircled by them, filled by them, and I knew for myself that the testimony of the man was true. My own judgments, natural endowments, an education bowed to this simple but mighty testimony. There sits the man who baptized me, Brother Eliezer Miller. His testimony filled my system with life. And my soul with joy. The world with all its wisdom, power, with all the glory and gilded show of its kings and potentates, sinks into perfect insignificance when compared to the simple, unadorned testimony of the servant of God.
The next fond memory I have as a missionary is that of daily engaging in scripture study. The discipline of following the scripture plan of learning the gospel was a wonderful, rewarding experience. The knowledge of teaching the scriptures would unfold in a glorious way through individual study. We would also take an hour or more each day to study as companions together. Having two sets of eyes examine the doctrine of the kingdom seemed to multiply our understanding. We would read together, then share our insights. Our minds were sharpened as we followed the daily practice of individual and companion study. The practice brought us closer together as, as companions and increased our understanding of the doctrines of the kingdom. Is this about your religious beliefs again? Look, Natalie, I, I know your church is important to you. I really respect that. I do. But I thought we liked each other. Remember how I said Heavenly Father has a plan for us? Mm -hmm. Well, I believe that real happiness comes only through following that plan. So for me, a serious relationship means preparing to go to the temple with someone who wants to make the same eternal covenants that I do. I won't begin a relationship that can't lead to the temple. I don't get it, Sarah. If your church believes so strongly in choice, then why are you against a woman choosing to have an abortion? It's going to take a minute to explain. Let's talk after class. and look at a bigger picture than just what happens here in this life. When you do, you can see that there's more going on with abortion than just ending a pregnancy. What does that mean? I guess my feelings on this are based on my understanding of the purpose of life. Well, what I mean is, life doesn't begin with birth or end with death. We lived before we came to Earth and we continue to live after we die. Do you really believe that? Yeah, I do. Heavenly Father has a plan for our lives. Part of that plan is to come to Earth and get a body. And as part of that plan, Heavenly Father shares with us the power to create other bodies. But He commands us to use it only in marriage. So if we use that power and choose to invite life, and then turn around and destroy it, that goes against God's purpose in even giving it to us in the first place. We're taking into our own hands powers reserved for Him. God gives us freedom of choice, but with it comes responsibility for our choices. So if we choose to use that power, we have to deal with the consequences of that choice. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. Thanks.
Why him? It's not fair. He had his whole life ahead of him. Why now? I weep for joy when I contemplate the significance of it all. To be redeemed is to be atoned, received in the close embrace of God, with an expression not only of His forgiveness, but of our oneness of heart and mind. What a privilege and what a comfort to those of us with loved ones who have already passed from our family circle through the gateway we call death. The priesthood is the power and authority of God delegated to man. Priesthood keys are the right to direct the use of that power. As has been mentioned tonight, the president of the church holds the keys necessary for governing the entire church. His counselors in the first presidency and the quorum of the Twelve Apostles also hold the keys of the kingdom and operate under the president's direction. Stake presidents, bishops, temple, mission, and quorum presidents are given keys to guide the church in their jurisdictions. Their counselors do not hold keys, but receive delegated authority by calling an assignment. Before his death, he had ordained and his apostles they carried on for a period. His church was set in place. The centuries rolled on. A cloud of darkness settled over the earth. It was a season of plunder and suffering marked by long and bloody conflict. The first thousand years passed and the second millennium dawned. Its earlier centuries were a continuation of the former. It was a time fraught with fear and suffering. As the years continued their relentless march, the sunlight of a new day began to break over the earth. It was the Renaissance, a magnificent flowering of art, architecture, and literature. Reformers worked to change the church, notably such men as Luther, Melanchthon, Huss, Zwingli, and Tyndale. These were men of great courage, some of whom suffered cruel deaths because of their beliefs. Their one desire was to find a niche in which they might worship God as they felt He should be worshipped. While this great ferment was stirring across the Christian world, political forces were also at work. Then came the American Revolutionary War, resulting in the birth of a nation whose constitution declared that government should not reach its grasping hand into matters of religion. A new day had dawned, a glorious day. Here there was no longer a state church. No one faith was favored above another. After centuries of darkness and pain and struggle, the time was ripe for the restoration of the gospel. Ancient prophets had spoken of this long-awaited day. That glorious day dawned in the year 1820, when a boy, earnest and with faith, walked into a grove of trees and lifted his voice in prayer, seeking that wisdom which he felt he so much needed. Joseph Smith translated the Book of Mormon by the gift and power of God. Compare this unique accomplishment with that of other scriptural translations. The King James Version of the Bible, for example, was produced by 50 English scholars who accomplished their work in seven years, translating at the rate of one page per day. Expert translators today do well if they can also translate Scripture at the rate of one page per day. In contrast, 
Joseph Smith translated the Book of Mormon at the rate of about 10 pages per day, completing the task in approximately 85 days. Such a pace is even more remarkable considering the circumstances under which the prophet labored. In that same period, while enduring constant distractions and incessant hostility, Joseph Smith moved more than 100 miles from Harmony, Pennsylvania to Fayette, New York. He applied for a copyright. He received revelations comprising 12 sections of the Doctrine and Covenants. Heavenly beings restored the holy priesthood. Yet, he completed the translation in less than three months. On April 6th of 1830, is a significant date for Latter-day Saints. It is the day the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints was organized. The translation of the pr and the printing of the Book of Mormon had been completed. The priesthood had been restored. And now the Lord directed that His Church should sh again be organized here on the earth. Prospective members of the Church gathered at the home of Peter Whitmer Sr. in Fayette, New York for this special occasion. The meeting was simple. Joseph Smith, then 24 years of age, called the group to order and designated five associates to join with him in satisfying New York's legal requirements for the incorporation of a religious society. After kneeling in solemn prayer, Joseph Smith proposed that he and Oliver Cowdery be called as teachers and spiritual advisors to the newly organized Church. Everyone raised their right arm to the square, and the pattern of sustaining Church leadership was established. In the process of conversion, the investigator of the Church hears a little, he may read a little, he does not, he cannot comprehend the wonder of it all. But if he is earnest in his search, if he is willing to get on his knees and pray about it, the Spirit touches his heart, perhaps ever so lightly. It points him in the right direction. He sees a little of what he has never seen before. And with faith, whether it be recognized or not, he takes a few guarded steps. Then another brighter vista opens before him. The faith of an investigator is like a piece of green wood thrown on a blazing fire. Warmed by the flames, it dries and begins to burn. But if it is pulled away, it cannot sustain itself. Its flickering flame dies. But if left with the fire, it gradually begins to burn with brightness. Soon it is part of the flaming fire and will light other greener wood. So, my brothers and sisters, this great work of faith, lifting people across this broad earth to increased understanding of the ways of the Lord, and greater happiness in following his pattern. When you are teaching investigators and preparing them for baptism by water, you must think of the gift of the Holy Ghost, baptism by fire. Think of it as one sentence. First comes baptism of water and then the baptism of fire. Someone may ask you, how are things going? Or are you teaching anyone? You automatically answer, yes, we have a family preparing for baptism and for confirmation for receiving the Holy Ghost. I repeat, to be baptized and to receive the Holy Ghost, link those two together. Again, there are two parts to baptism, 
Baptism by water and baptism by fire or the Holy Ghost. If you separate the two, as the prophet Joseph Smith said, it is but half a baptism. Put the two together so that you almost forbid yourself to say baptism without saying confirmation. That is baptism by water and confirmation and conferring of the gift of the Holy Ghost. Get that idea in your mind that those two are fixed together so tightly that as one, it becomes part of you. This work is rigorous. It demands strength and vitality. It demands mental sharpness and capacity. I remind you that missionary work is not a rite of passage in the church. It is a call extended by the president of the church to those who are worthy and able to accomplish it. Good physical and mental health is vital. vital. There are parents who say, if only we can get Johnny on a mission, then the Lord will bless him with health. It seems not to work out that way. Rather, whatever ailment or physical or mental shortcoming a missionary has when he comes into the field only becomes aggravated under the stress of the work. We simply must face up to the facts. Missionary work is extremely demanding. If you have emotional challenges that can be stabilized to meet the rigors of a full-time mission, you can be called. It is vital that you continue to use your medication during your mission or until competent medical authority counsels otherwise. Recognize that emotional and physical challenges are alike. One needs to do all that is possible to improve the situation, then learn to live within the remaining bounds. God uses challenges that we may grow by conquering them. When I arrived there, I was not well. I felt I wasn't getting anywhere in the missionary work. And I became discouraged. I wrote a letter to my father and said, I'm wasting my time and your money. I don't see any point in my staying here. And in due time, a letter came back from him in which he simply said, Dear Gordon, I have your letter of such and such a date. I have only one suggestion. Forget yourself and go to work. Love with love your father. I pondered that, and the next morning in our scripture class, we read that great statement of the Lord. He that saveth his life shall lose it. He that loseth his life for my sake and the gospel shall find it. It touched me. That statement, that promise, in conjunction with my father's letter, prompted me to go upstairs in the little bedroom at 15 Wadham Road, Preston, Lancashire, where we lived get on my knees and make a covenant with the Lord that I would try to forget myself and go to work. I count that as the day of decision in my life. Everything good that's happened to me since then, I can trace back to the decision I made at that time. You will have occasion to ask, why is this work so hard? Why doesn't it go better? Why can't our success be more rapid? Why aren't there more people joining the church? It is the truth. We believe in angels. We trust and have seen miracles. Why don't people just flock to the font? Why isn't the only risk in the mission field that of pneumonia? Just being soaking wet all day and all night in the baptismal font. You'll have occasion to ask those questions. 
I have thought about these questions a great deal, and I offer this as my personal feeling. I am convinced that missionary work is not easy because salvation is not a cheap experience. Salvation was never easy. We are the church of Jesus Christ. This is the truth. He is our great eternal head. How would we believe that it could possibly be easy for us when it was never, ever easy for him? When you struggle, when you're rejected, when you're spit on, or cast out, or made a hiss and a byword, you are taking your place and standing with the best life this world has ever known. The only pure and perfect life ever lived. You have reason to stand tall and be grateful that the living Son of the living God knows all about your sorrows and your disappointments and your afflictions.